45 seconds. A burst of gunfire. And the political landscape of America changed forever. The murder of John F. Kennedy, America's 35th president, still ranks as one of the defining moments of the 1960s. The images captured during those fateful moments were flashed around the world. Images taken by dozens of photographers who'd come to capture a fleeting glimpse of a dream. They captured a nightmare. But what did those cameras actually record? Could these separate frames hold extra clues as to what happened that afternoon? Unsolved History will revisit the scene of the crime, Dealey Plaza in downtown Dallas, and turn it into a virtual laboratory. Using the original images and the original cameras in the original locations, experts will reconstruct those 45 seconds that shocked the world. The very public murder of President John F. Kennedy in Dallas, Texas on November the 22nd, 1963 has left behind a host of questions. Seeking answers, a team of experts will study the known images of the Kennedy assassination. Chief Investigator Daniel Martinez. Gary Mack, historian. Still photographer, Mark Waggy. Veteran filmmaker, Steve McWilliams. And computer graphics expert, Douglas Martin. Merging their skills and applying 21st century science, these investigators will analyze those fatal brief moments in Dallas when history was made. It's almost become a cliche to say it, but you know, everybody remembers where they were when the assassination took place. The country changed, their lives changed, and nothing would ever be the same. We were in the midst of the Cold War, the Civil Rights Movement, and the outer fringes of a place called Vietnam. And the leadership of our country was cut away by an assassin's bullet. When John F. Kennedy died that afternoon, the sense of loss and grief was felt around the world. It was as if the hopes and dreams of a generation had been violated. The rich young senator was described as the first superstar president. He and his beautiful wife held court at what became known as the Camelot White House. And despite the fact that he was the youngest president in American history, his successes at home and abroad were impressive. He had taken on the Soviet regime on the historically critical issues of Berlin and Cuba and emerged victorious. He had inspired a nation to put a man on the moon. He had created the Peace Corps. And he had confronted the issue that was still dividing America. Racism, segregation and the battle for civil rights. So as he journeyed to Texas in November 1963 for a two-day round of speeches, lunches and dinners, Hopes were riding high that the 1964 presidential elections would endorse Kennedy for another term of office in the White House. After a working breakfast with the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce, the president and his entourage journeyed to Dallas. Air Force One landed at Love Field outside Dallas shortly after 11 o'clock on the morning of November the 22nd, 1963. As the president and his wife, Jacqueline, crossed the tarmac, cameraman David Wigman was there. He was there for a story, but it wasn't the one he expected. We were about seven cars back, and we actually waited until uh, we saw crowds to start shooting, and it seemed to me I remember shooting along here because the driver was helpful. He'd say, you're in, you're in the main part of town, or here's where, where our good crowds are. 
The motorcade turned off Main Street onto Houston Street, then turned left onto Elm Street and into Dealey Plaza, directly underneath the Texas School Book Depository. It was here that John F. Kennedy met his fate. Bang! 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 Just about like that. It, it, it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something John Fitzgerald Kennedy was rushed to Parkland Memorial Hospital with devastating head wounds. Shortly after one o'clock, doctors pronounced the president dead. Within an hour, police arrested a suspect, Lee Harvey Oswald. Oswald worked at the book depository, from which many claimed the shots had been fired. But Oswald never got to face his accusers. Two days later, Dallas bar owner Jack Ruby shot him dead. But far from being the end of the matter, Oswald's death triggered a storm of theories and accusations. And the question has always been the same. Did he act alone in killing President Kennedy? Ever since that fateful day in November 1963, when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, it has been questioned whether the man arrested for the crime, Lee Harvey Oswald, had acted alone. The official investigation concluded that he had. But others continue to maintain that there must have been more than one gunman. The evidence has been in dispute for decades. The official view is that President Kennedy's assassin took up position here in the book depository, shooting from above and behind. But others believe another gunman was also firing from the front. They say he was positioned behind a fence at the back of what became known as the Grassy Knoll. The question is, why didn't any of the numerous images captured that day record the presence of that second gunman? What we're going to do is try to replicate what happened on November 22, 1963, and you each know your parts, you're going to play one of the photographers. What Historians we'll have studied the scene is, of the murder uh, in meticulous detail. And exactly where the president... They know that there were about 500 people present. 30 of them had cameras. And of those 30, 10 recorded moments from the critical 45 seconds when the motorcade was in Dealey Plaza. What did their cameras capture? And perhaps more importantly, what didn't they capture? And why? Why has it never been clear what really happened in this small Dallas park that day? One of the questions we hear most often from people who've never been to Dallas before is, my goodness, it's so small. Dealey Plaza is tiny. The geography of Dealey Plaza is important because it's key to so many aspects. Where the shooters could have been, where the shots could have come from, to the photographic evidence, eyewitness evidence. The plaza's layout is the same today as it was in 1963. Not much has changed except that the sixth floor of the former Texas School Book Depository is now a museum. A museum dedicated to the tragic events that occurred here 40 years ago. The exhibits include many of the actual cameras used on that day in 1963. And the museum's archive contains negatives and images from the original films which still preserve the last seconds of John Kennedy's life. By stringing these films and photographs together, we've got a clock now of about 45 seconds from when the president's car turned into Dealey Plaza until the moment that he was killed. To analyze these pictures with any accuracy, the experts must know exactly where the photographers were standing in order to complete the reconstruction. To recreate those positions, our graphic artist, Douglas Martin, used a special digital camera to build a seamless 360-degree panorama of Dealey Plaza. From this information, Martin then created a virtual model of the location accurate to within 20 centimeters. 
Using this digital image, the experts can pinpoint the position of each camera operator and their fields of view. To make this more clear, I've color-coded the field of views from the different cameras. The yellow indicates still pictures, while the red indicates moving footage. This looks real good, but we need to move Bronson a little bit. He was in the center, an unknown woman is standing to his left, and his wife is to the right. Great, perfect. However, digital images can only tell part of the story. He went to work. The experts also invited some of those people who were there taking pictures on that fateful day to return to the scene of the crime and relive those shocking moments. People began to fall around me. I, well, something's happening. I thought they were firecrackers. Somebody grabbed me and pulled me down to the ground. The Kennedy assassination was the first time where Americans suddenly felt, I'm not as safe as I thought I was. Suddenly, cameras that had been used to record safe images of blissful innocence were being used to record the violent horror of a president's murder. But what unseen information is actually embedded in the tiny grains of silver that make up these ancient images? Could these aging frames shed new light on the mystery of John Kennedy's death? Well, the images keep the story going, in a sense. Uh, but the images also answer some questions. They help people try to make sense of this. And there's a lot of controversy about what did or did not happen. Come on, John. To answer these questions, on, Gary Mack decided to repopulate Dealey yeah. Plaza with volunteers. Turning off They'd of, take up uh, the exact positions of the amateur cameramen and women who were there that day. The Their job? Yep. To help the show what the Dealey Plaza photographers could or could not have seen. As, as limo was approaching. Well, I think many people don't realize how many films and photographs were taken in Dealey Plaza that day. There were so many different angles and so many different viewpoints and so many questions that can be asked and hopefully answered by the photographs. That making people aware of this imagery and this information is important. Robert Hughes worked on the south side of the plaza. At lunchtime that Friday, he picked a spot near the corner of Main Street and Houston Street. He brought his camera, an 8mm Bell & Howell, loaded with Kodachrome to capture the vibrant colours of the Texas autumn. As he waited, Hughes filmed the crowd. And when JFK's limousine turned off Main Street, he filmed for another 18 seconds. The middle of the shot shows the book depository, including the sixth floor window where Oswald is said to have been waiting. Several witnesses saw a gun sticking out the window and, and saw the shots fired. Hughes could have caught that, but by then the limousine was out of, out of his sight. It had turned the corner and, and was out of his view, so he stopped filming. Within five seconds, the shooting started, just like that. Orville Nix was also on Houston Street, not far away from Hughes. He then moved around the corner and filmed the vehicles in the distance as they drove past the grassy knoll. Nix was using an 8mm Keystone camera with an automatic zoom. His son, Orville Jr., remembers his father's story from that day. So your dad was right about here, and what did he do next? Well, the parade turned right here on Houston Street, so he started taking pictures. Got about two or three seconds worth of pictures taken there. Thought maybe he could get a better shot from right over here. I'll show you. Like the other onlookers that day, Nix kept repositioning himself to get better pictures. He didn't think much about it until he heard a shot or a noise. When he did, he was up here and he turned and started taking pictures. The Nix footage includes a blurry view of the fatal gunshot with the knoll just beyond. That's where some believe a second gunman lurked. Well, the next film is probably the second clearest film of the fatal shot to President Kennedy's head. But his film shows the grassy knoll during the shooting. If his film had been lighter, if, 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 there might have been a clear image of the grassy knoll to know for sure whether there was another gunman there or not. Not far from Orville, Charles Bronson and his wife Frances had already identified an excellent camera position from which they could film the motorcade. 
enthusiastic amateurs, they had brought their very best still and movie cameras. For 40 years almost after Visiting Dealey Plaza four Dealey decades, Plaza decades later, Francis explains exactly where she and Charles stood to take their pictures. And this was a good place. They were coming down the street there, so we... Coming toward you. Right. Mm -hmm. and we got so here comes the motorcade and... The couple car, climbed onto this what, concrete what plinth happened. to give them a clear view of Main Street. The entire length of Houston, including the Texas School Book Depository. And in the distance, the entire length of Elm Street. Six minutes before the presidential parade, Charles filmed the front of the Texas School Book Depository, inadvertently capturing 92 frames of the sniper's window just before the president's arrival. That window that's so critical to trying to give us some, the kind of evidence of who may have been up there, and if they were definitely there, it's lost to history because the camera shut off. And that's the problem with all the photographers. They all caught some important things, but they all missed the crucial thing, which was the person in the window. Charles began filming again as the first motorcycle officers approached. Jackie in her pink hat and pink outfit and waving to the public, and we really enjoyed that, getting to see the both of them. And Going right around the corner here right. and up Houston Street toward the book depository. Right. As the motorcade turned onto Elm Street, Charles Bronson was waiting with his still camera. He heard the first gunshot just as he clicked the shutter. Four seconds later, now using his movie camera, he filmed a short sequence which captured the second fatal shot. And Charles said, that sounds like gunshots, let's get out of here. Looking again at just two seconds of 8mm film slowed down, Bronson gives us a distant view of the murder taking place and, like Orville Nix, tantalizing glimpses of both the grassy knoll and the book depository. Not long after the shooting, investigators discovered that there had even been a photographer inside the book depository only a few meters from Lee Harvey Oswald's position. Elsie Dorman worked two floors down and two windows across. She had no camera skills. But at her family's insistence, she had taken the movie camera to work that day. Her son Jim recalls what happened. She had the camera along the side of her face okay. looking through the viewfinder. And she was filming the motorcade as it turned and then came down the street and then turned down uh, Elm Street to the triple underpass. Inexperienced in using the camera, Elsie Dorman did the best she could, but the results are tantalizingly poor. The viewfinder in the camera was one that you had to look through, which of course it obstructed her view and bothered her quite a bit because she really couldn't see what she wanted to see because the camera basically was in her face. It's such a wasted opportunity. She had the ideal location to record the limousine going down Elm. And this is the most frustrating film of all. Elsie Dorman was just flopping her camera around and uh, she just, she was an amateur. In more skilled hands, this camera position might have captured key details for the investigators of the time. The trees that now block the view have grown substantially in 40 years. In 1963, the view of the plaza would have been much clearer. But Elsie did record the presence of another group of Dealey Plaza photographers. The Towner family, who are at the Elm Street curb. Jim Towner was using a still camera. Daughter Tina had the family movie camera. Tina was 13. Her dad had given her the VariZoom home movie camera while he took stills. The Towners were standing right at the corner of Elm Street and Houston Street. He told me what to do. He told me to follow the motorcade around the corner instead of holding the camera still. When Jim Towner took this picture of JFK as his car turned off Houston Street, the president had just 10 seconds left to live. There were people in the way here, but as soon as I could see the motorcade through my lens, then I, f I followed him around the corner like this. Okay. And when we could see the, only their backs, then I quit taking 
pictures. The Towner film ends moments before the shooting. Kennedy had gone from her view, and she couldn't see him anymore, so she stopped filming. Within a second or two at the most, bang, first shot. Phil Willis was there with his camera too. He took several pictures on Houston Street and two more as the vehicle turned onto Elm Street. His images were significant. His daughter, Linda, was with him that day. Here that day, we were across from the courthouse, and my dad began snapping pictures with an Argus 35 millimeter camera. As the motorcade turned right onto Houston Street, my dad was still snapping pictures. As the limousine turned, position right about here, and he had stepped off of the curb and captured one of the last shots of Kennedy alive from this vantage point. As a picture of JFK, this image is poor. The president is barely visible. But its significance lies in its background. There, beyond the motorcade, is a clear view of the grassy knoll. What's so tantalizing about the Willis picture mm -hmm. is that if there was a grassy knoll gunman, he's got to be in the background there somewhere. And you can look at this picture for every day for the rest of your life, and you may or may not see anything. He was so close. In an effort to extract every last piece of information from the pictures taken that day, Unsolved History has turned to image technicians from around the world to see whether the 40-year-old frames can be improved. We take film images and scan them on the spirits, which is scanning at 2,000 lines, and we have a very sophisticated colour corrector in here, and we can do all kinds of image manipulation. Working from a copy of a copy of a copy of the original 8mm film, technicians struggle to regain some of the clarity of the original. We had the film in our library, but the condition that was in it was very hard to pick out some of the, the detail in the film and see the events. Once the film has been converted into bits and bytes, however, the transformation is remarkable. This film came to me as clean as it could be. Obviously, there was some inherent dirt in what was originally the 8mm to 16mm blow-up, which there's nothing I can do. So some of the dirt was printed, if you like. It was, it was um, put in the printing process, which wouldn't come off. I was able to sharpen the film slightly, or sharpen the image slightly electronically to allow us to see a little bit more of the detail. After four days of intense effort, the details become apparent. In the final frames of this historic footage, it's now possible to get a better view of another photographer who has eluded investigators for four decades. This figure, known to researchers as the Babushka Lady, also clearly has a camera raised to her eyes, filming the historic moment. But no one has seen her, or whatever she filmed, since that day. Over time, her disappearance has fueled curiosity and suspicion about what her film might reveal. A woman has come forward claiming that she is that person. A Kodak lab technician remembers a photograph from a very different woman. That picture was out of focus, uh, so the woman went home, walked out of history. Piece by piece, Unsolved History is now building a mosaic of the scenes that were captured in Dealey Plaza that afternoon. Scenes that will shed new light on an old question. Why don't we know who killed John F. Kennedy? As JFK's motorcade was entering Dealey Plaza on November the 22nd, 1963, some 30 people had cameras ready to record the president's visit to Dallas. Just a moment, please. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Stand by, please. Parkland Hospital, there has been a shooting. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. After the shots rang out, the limousine driver began his desperate dash to Parkland Hospital, and the cameras kept rolling. Film shot by Orville Nix shows people in the crowd running towards the grassy knoll. 
Robert Hughes filmed the panicked stampede from a different angle. By studying all of the hundreds of images captured that day, investigators began to ask questions about the capabilities of film and camera technology at the time. Even under ideal circumstances, what could those photographers have actually recorded? In theory, Mary Ann Mormon should have been able to take the perfect shot. She had chosen her place on Elm Street and was just a few meters away from the motorcade. Hers was a new instant Polaroid camera. She pointed it at the spot where the motorcade would pass between her and the grassy knoll, waiting for the right moment to press the shutter. As the car was coming down and it's moving, and you don't have much time because it is a Polaroid. I just stepped to the, uh, to the edge here and Gene is hollering, look, Mr. President, look our way. And then I snapped the picture, which was at the same instant, evidently, as the bullet hit him, not realizing that's what had happened, but I did hear a noise. From five meters away, Mary Ann unknowingly took her picture at the precise moment when President Kennedy received the fatal head wound. I could see people around me um, falling to the ground or running and doing, and that, you know, let me to know something is happening. Her instant print also shows the clearest view of the knoll at the moment JFK was shot. From Mary Ann's position, she could also have aimed her lens back and up at the book depository. If she'd pressed the shutter button a few seconds earlier, she would have captured the sixth floor window and perhaps the barrel of a rifle. She didn't, of course, but does this extraordinary image have any other stories to tell? This is the cleanest copy of this I've ever seen. This is a copy of the version kept by the Dallas FBI office. The FBI copied her photograph shortly after the assassination, maybe a week or so later. And under the Freedom of Information, uh, back in the 1980s, I obtained this print. To reveal background detail, technicians must enlarge this six centimeter print many times over. It could provide conspiracy theorists with substance to back their claim that Oswald did not act alone. But how would this camera's lens show an assassin? Is the inquiry looking the correct way at the proper place for the right thing? To analyze it, investigators arranged to recreate Mormon's picture and the history it captured. So Marianne Mormon was right here, and what we're going to do is replicate her shot. Basically. Very Investigator famous. Mark Waggy, a photographic expert, okay, has brought an assortment of equipment to the plaza. Today we have approximately the same light that they had in 1963. Right, which is a very good this will be great for thing this, for our test. For this test. Three actors position themselves on the steps. One stands where a second gunman might have been in 1963 behind the fence at the far side of the knoll. Waggy goes into action with a camera identical to the one Mormon used. Then he switches to a more sophisticated 35 mm camera from that era to see what it might have recorded in addition to what Mormon's Polaroid was able to capture. Once the film is processed, the investigators visit Waggy's studio to examine the results. First, the new image from that vintage Polaroid. Polaroid negative. Here's the Polaroid print, two size. That could be enlarged, of course, but that's the original off the camera. Unlike Mormon's picture, this one is very clear. It shows the gunman deliberately posed in the shadows, but no details about him. However, in the Mormon print, you can't even see a silhouette. The Knoll's character has changed, but not radically. It seems that her camera and film, while sophisticated for their time, simply weren't capable of recording such nuances.
it's a print, it had no negative, and yet it's a 3000 ASA film, so it had clumps of silver in it the size of New Hampshire, probably. Right. <laughs> Uh, and she had stopped down her lens all the way, so she had focus front to rear, probably, right. with depth of field. But when you stop down a lens, it's, it's notorious for uh, destroying the resolving power of the lens, so it's not that sharp. Yeah. I don't think we can dismiss any theories just based on that print because it's just simply not clear enough to, to know what's going on along the stockade fence. There's just not enough information and never will be. But what if Mormon had used a faster, sharper camera? Could it have recorded a mystery gunman and perhaps sent history in a new direction? If we take a look at, at the 35 millimeter right. film, I don't think we would identify ever the person that we have sitting back there, but you take a look. Mm -hmm. There would be no question that that is definitely a human, and, and you'd get some idea of a stocking cap on. So yeah, you can certainly it would be see obvious. Him. If she'd had a 35 millimeter camera with a good film of the day, then we'd probably have some of these questions answered, or they just never would have come up. All this speculation begs the question would hired killers have risked being photographed by so many people? Well, if it was a professional hit team, then they knew what they were doing. They knew where to hide. They took a risk, of course, but they were professionals. They, they were doing their job, and they succeeded. The official inquiry dismissed the suggestion of a hit team and concluded that lone gunman Lee Harvey Oswald fired from this sixth floor window. But the conspiracy theorists continue to claim that there was at least one other marksman hiding somewhere at the back of the grassy knoll. Investigators believe that if other gunmen had existed, amateur photographer Mary Muchmore would have captured them on film. She filmed twice that afternoon. Once as the motorcade reached the end of Main Street and turned onto Houston Street. She then hurried through the trees to catch the limousines as they moved down Elm Street. As she filmed, she captured the fatal shot framed against the grassy knoll beyond. Analysts have repeatedly studied her footage to see what clues might lie within it, comparing it with the few seconds Orville Nix also captured. Orville Nix had also found a position with a clear view of Elm Street and the knoll. Orville Nix was about 20 Dallas cinematographer Steve McWilliams of, uh, took the assignment of reshooting the Nix footage. The camera, he would show what Nix got on film and, and perhaps more. And replicate with the film stocks that we have today and uh, see if we can expose and, and get an image similar to what he had that day. Nix made a common amateur's mistake that day. He loaded indoor film stock and was shooting outdoors. Not an irretrievable error if he'd also used a correcting filter, but he didn't, and so his film is shadowy. Details of the null are obscured. This is Pretty an 8mm? This is called double 8 like, or regular What eight. would Nix have filmed if he'd done things correctly? Twice. Really? Then, Again, the mock shooter crouches far back on the null. Again, this time with a vintage movie camera properly set and filtered, the scene is recorded. At a processing lab, technicians enhance and enlarge it, frame by frame, using machines no one could have imagined in 1963. So, what was happening in the scene Orville Nix shot so poorly? By repeating his efforts using professional techniques, can experts find details on the knoll that his film missed? By overexposing the film and being able to look into the shadow areas. Look at that. Yeah, there's you, a you there's can start a person to see. standing there. You could you can see it. There's still areas though that I look at and I go, is that a person or a shadow? And I was there shooting it and uh, it's it's hard to know. But I think when you do run the the film in motion, right. um, you do see uh, more information. You can get some uh, additional information. 
View the Kennedy assassination from enough angles, and it's clear why such an air of mystery and conspiracy envelops it. So many intriguing details are missing. Had Orville Nix known how to use his camera, he might have recorded some of those details. But even in the blurred, grainy and out-of-focus images taken that day, connections can be made that can help to build a bigger picture. Can you stop it right there? What's interesting is, uh, even in these dark shadows, you can see Abraham Sapruder and his receptionist standing as he's filming, uh, obviously, his very famous footage. But even with them in dark clothes, the flesh tones come out. That afternoon, however, there was one man who did know how to use his camera and who was filming at that key moment in history. His name was Abraham Zapruder. Zapruder's offices were in the Dal Tex building near the book depository. Urged by his employees to film his favorite president, he crossed the plaza to a spot that seemed to offer a good view of the motorcade's route. He chose well. You can walk around Dealey Plaza today looking for a better spot and you probably won't find one. That one was perfect. He was above the crowd. He had a sweeping view. He planned it all. Zapruder had an 8mm Bell & Howell, zoom lens, Kodachrome 2 film. He's in the Willis photo with his receptionist, Marilyn Sitzman, holding him steady on the concrete pedestal. During the 26 seconds that he filmed, Abraham Zapruder shot the only footage showing the entire horrible sequence. I had a shot. Then he gets slumped to the side, like this. Then I had another shot or two, I couldn't say it was one or two. And I saw his head practically open up, all blood and everything. And I kept on shooting. One of the first people to see Abraham Zapruder's extraordinary film was laboratory technician Phil Chamberlain. The reaction of the people in the room was generally that of being stunned. You could hear intakes of breath and look at that and sobs, and particularly the frame where Kennedy's head literally exploded, uh, you could hear sudden intake of breath of people as they watched it. We can now tie the Zapruder film into our timeline of Dealey Plaza photography and see the small details that transport us back in time. The Zapruder film became legendary as the only images showing the entire horrifying sequence of a president being cut down by gunfire. The moments before the assassination, the president is just now reaching the Dealey Plaza. As you go down Elm Street, the crowds get thinner and thinner and thinner. Up in the back, you can see uh, wearing a blue skirt is uh, Tina Towner and her mother and father, so they're waiting. And Zapruder is filming because he doesn't know what to expect. And the first car he sees that looks like it might have the president, he starts filming. You can see Willis there, he's actually in the street. He's taking a picture right there. And, of course, the motorcycles are real close, so he's going to step back. And Willis is winding his camera right now and is about to take an, his next picture, which he always said was as a result of hearing the first shot. It startled him. And he's going to take his picture uh, right about here. As the car continues down the street, we'll see the woman called the babushka lady. But as you can see, there's a man standing in front of her. So it's hard to say what her film might or might not show because there's a head blocking her view. And now coming into the frame is Jean Hill. And there's Mary Mormon with her Polaroid camera. She can't quite see Kennedy because his head is blocked from her view by Jackie. But now she gets a view of Kennedy's head and she's about to take her picture and click. That's the moment of the fatal shot. Gary, this is just moments after the assassination. And look at these two individuals. I'd never noticed that before. Yeah, they're running east. They're running away. Seconds earlier when the shooting was going on, they were directly in the line of fire, at least from the building. So they're now running to get out of the line of fire. 
And here's the limousine that's going into the triple underpass. Zapruder is about ready to stop filming. But if Zapruder had continued filming and panned to his right, he'd have recorded the knoll and the fence. He might have filmed someone whom skeptics say fled after shooting JFK. You know, Gary, if he had just panned one more inch, he could have captured that stockade fence and that inch could have changed history. He might have answered all the questions, but he could have raised a lot more. With the Sapruda film in place, Unsolved History can now travel back in time to reconstruct the exact sequence of events that took place that sunny afternoon in Dallas, Texas. November the 22nd, 1963, the day John F. Kennedy was assassinated in full view of hundreds of people and dozens of cameras. Virtually every second was captured by a camera somewhere. Gary, now that you see the photos in their point of view, what does this tell you? Well, it's impressive to see it graphically like this, to see how much area in Dealey Plaza was actually covered by films and photographs. What a unique opportunity to go back in time through the computer to try and figure out what happened. The ultimate reconstruction leads to fascinating conclusions. During those critical 45 seconds, photographers cover an amazing extent of Dealey Plaza, but not the two locations from which the fatal gunshots could have been fired. No one panned across the infamous grassy knoll with a movie camera, and still photos of it are too blurry. Early images show the book depository window, but not those taken as the shots were fired. Other potential firing positions weren't in the pictures either. The Daltex building, the book depository's west side windows, the top floors of the county records building. A gunman would have had a clear shot from any of these. No matter what direction the bullets came from, they found their mark in seconds that will replay forever on the Zapruder film. Even after decades, the scene is troubling to watch. What's sometimes lost in this is this is a murder of a human being, our leader. When people study the film, I mean, you have to filter out what's really going on, because otherwise you have to stop and think about what all this means. And so, here in their entirety are the 45 seconds that shocked America and the world. At precisely 12.30, the Kennedy's limousine enters Dealey Plaza. Ten cameras, ten viewpoints, ten tantalizing records of an unsolved murder that still baffles historians. The Kennedy assassination photography is a double-edged sword, so to speak, in that the pictures answer a lot of questions. But sure enough, every time you look at them, you find more questions. I look at it as like a jigsaw puzzle. When it's spread out all over the floor, 
you can't tell what it is. But when you put enough of the pieces together, you get the picture. And I think that's what will happen with this case. But this is a jigsaw that's still missing a few key pieces. The debate about who killed John F. Kennedy continues to rage. Conspiracy theories propose a host of clandestine agencies and multiple murderers. But for 40 years, they and their actions have evaded scrutiny. And evidence of their existence is still missing. Perhaps, with so many cameras present, they have simply been astonishingly lucky. What is certain, however, is that something very precious died in Dealey Plaza that sunny afternoon. An innocence that permitted the leader of the free world to ride the crowded streets in an open-topped car, in full view of thousands of well-wishers who shared the man's dream for a bright new future. And in full view of at least one man with a high-powered rifle. The images of the assassination are significant because they act as a time traveler. They take us back to November 22nd, 1963, but we can't stop the film. And so we witness the cruelty and the obscene murder of a president. And we're haunted by it even to this day.